Hello, and thank you for joining me today. I will be talking about pragmatic research, how it can complement, extend, and challenge how you do science and increase your impact. My name is Jennifer Stevens Lapsley, and I'm a professor of physical therapy and the director of the Rehabilitation Science PhD program at the University of Colorado. I also have an appointment at the Eastern Colorado Healthcare System VA. My presentation will be followed by that of Dr. Betker, who will introduce herself. As far as conflicts of interest, we both have funding from federal sources, and I sit on the NIH National Advisory Board for Medical Rehabilitation Research. So for part one of this presentation, I'm going to provide an overview of why we need pragmatic clinical trials, how pragmatic clinical trials are different from other designs, give you a tool that helps you evaluate how pragmatic your trial is, and an example, as well as discuss some of the barriers to pragmatic trials. So whether you're a basic scientist or you're invested in the design of rehabilitation devices to enhance function, or you're a clinical trialist, the content of this presentation is designed to apply to research audiences broadly because it helps provide a better understanding of the translational spectrum that is necessary for our research to impact the people we're trying to reach. So before I begin, I wanna thank Russ Glasgow and Amy Hipschman for their contributions to this presentation as leaders in the field of pragmatic research. Let's start with the definition of pragmatic trials for context. Although I'll go into more detail regarding specific characteristics compared to other designs later in this presentation. But pragmatic randomized control trials mimic usual care or usual clinical practice and they are critical to inform decision-making by patients, clinicians, and policymakers in real-world settings. What's the need for pragmatic research? Well, traditional clinical trials are slow and expensive, and often findings are not seen as relevant. In other words, they don't translate well into clinical practice. In fact, it takes an average of 17 years before 14% of research findings lead to widespread changes in clinical care. That means 86% of research lives on the bookshelf and not in the world. This is a depressing statistic for those of us engaged in clinical research because in fact, it's not just 17 years, but it's the time that you consider prior to actually publishing that research, getting that grant funded, maybe the pilot data, and actually conducting the research itself. In total, we might be looking at 20 to 25 years. So even if you're a basic scientist, understanding the value of pragmatic trials and implementation science will increase the likelihood of eventual translation of research across the continuum. Why should we care? Well, a drug, an intervention, or a device is only good if it's adopted, if people are trained to use it, if people choose to use it, and if populations eligible for it benefit from it. Said another way, the importance of an idea or action lies in whether it makes a difference in everyday life. Ideas or actions that correspond to attractive explanations but make no difference to outcomes are problematic. So how do we set the stage for our science to be more impactful across the continuum of research? I'm gonna make a case that there's an urgent need for pragmatic research combined with implementation science methodologies to speed up translation of our research. As a rehab community, if we can embrace pragmatic research, we may help lead the charge for faster translation. So now let's talk about how pragmatic trials are different from other designs. So explanatory research, often referred to as efficacy-focused research, involves tightly controlled trials under fairly ideal circumstances. The goal is to prove efficacy rather than effectiveness and the goal is often to pursue a mechanistic understanding of how treatments work. In contrast, pragmatic research involves trials performed under normal conditions with the intention of providing applicable results to clinical practice and decision making. Pragmatic research is concerned with producing answers to questions faced by decision makers. They are typically studies that select clinically relevant alternative interventions to compare they often include a diverse population of study participants, they recruit participants from heterogeneous practice settings, and they collect data stored on a broad range of health outcomes. 
pragmatic clinical trials take into consideration a large number of mediators and moderators that influence the implementation process and are more likely to produce practice-based evidence than their highly controlled counterparts. An important point to emphasize is that pragmatic does not mean less rigorous. But to be clear, there's value in both. So while I'm highlighting the benefits of pragmatic research, there's no question that we still need explanatory research. Some of my trials are pragmatic, but there are good reasons why some of my trials are still explanatory. This graphic illustrates different types of research culminating with implementation studies. We start with efficacy studies and progress to effectiveness or pragmatic studies, and then on to implementation studies, which are still pragmatic in nature. Even though this graphic suggests a stepwise progression, keep in mind that at any step along the way, it might be necessary to go back a step to refine some element of the intervention to be more effective. This isn't always a linear process. However, wherever you are in the process, it's never too early to plan for implementation. Let me provide a high level clinical example. If you want to evaluate a rehab intervention provided by a specially trained therapist to patients with low back pain, this would be an efficacy or explanatory trial. But now, if you want to train all therapists in a particular clinic to provide that same intervention, you're going to have a wide range of clinicians. Some might be new graduates, some might have specialty certifications. And so now you're talking about an effectiveness trial, which is pragmatic. Once effectiveness is established, then you move into implementation studies where there are a number of frameworks and methods to further evaluate best strategies for implementation of the intervention in an entire healthcare system, maybe randomizing at the level of the clinic. In some cases, implementation studies would still try to more firmly establish effectiveness while gathering preliminary information on implementation strategies. And in other cases, when effectiveness is well established, implementation studies are focused on comparing the best strategies for implementing a given intervention. Dr. Betger will go into more detail regarding implementation methods. So there are key differences between traditional randomized controlled trials and pragmatic controlled trials. A traditional RCT tests a hypothesis under ideal conditions, whereas a pragmatic trial compares treatments under everyday clinical conditions. The goal of a traditional RCT is to determine causes and effects of treatment, whereas in a pragmatic trial, it's to improve practice and inform clinical and policy decisions. The design of a traditional RCT tests the intervention against the placebo using rigid study protocols and minimal variation. It tests two or more real world clinical treatments or protocols with some flexibility and local customization. Participants in a traditional RCT are highly defined and carefully selected. Whereas in a pragmatic trial, the participants are more representative because eligibility criteria are less strict. You can see that here, a traditional RCT, we have the eligible population and a number of exclusions where we end up with an efficacy trial at the, with very few people actually included that meet those criteria. Whereas in a pragmatic trial, the eligible population is very minimally reduced with the inclusion and exclusion criteria. When it comes to measures, a traditional RCT requires data collection outside of routine clinical care whereas a pragmatic trial is brief, requires brief data collection, and is designed so that data can be easily collected in clinical settings. And when it comes to results, the results of a traditional RCT are often not relevant to everyday practice immediately, whereas in a pragmatic trial, they're useful in everyday practice, especially for clinical decision-making more immediately. There are some important caveats and things to remember about pragmatic trials on this slide. Pragmatic trials are not an abandonment of the scientific methods that have led to countless breakthroughs. They don't take away from basic science or diminish the importance of traditional RCTs. We just need a balance. And no study is completely explanatory or pragmatic. RCTs and pragmatic clinical trials exist on a continuum. So now I'm going to give you an example of a tool that can be used to evaluate how pragmatic your trial is called the Praces tool, and it's actually the Praces 2 that I'm going to be talking about. Multiple relevant stakeholders developed this, so patients, community partners, clinicians, public health workers, clinical trialist researchers, policymakers, and it can be used when you're designing a new study. You might be considering how to make your trial more pragmatic. It can also be used to evaluate the literature 
How pragmatic is a study that you're reading? And it can also be used in grants. You can use this diagram to actually demonstrate how pragmatic your trial is. So the way it works is there's a spoke and wheel design with pragmatic ratings for each of the Precy's two domains, which are the spokes. So each domain like eligibility, recruitment setting represents one of the spokes. And the ratings run from one to five, five being the most pragmatic, one being the least pragmatic. And you can rate each of these domains on a scale of one to five and determine overall how pragmatic is your trial. So let's take a couple of examples. Let's look at eligibility, which is the extent to which participants in the trial are similar to those who would potentially receive the intervention in a usual care setting. A rating of five, which would be highly pragmatic, means that the selection criteria are, are highly inclusive. Very few people were excluded. Whereas a rating of one is highly explanatory. Maybe there was a stepwise selection process or the study was restricted to participants that are highly responsive to the experimental intervention. If we look at setting, how different is the setting of the trial from usual care? A highly pragmatic approach would involve a setting that's nearly identical to the locations where the results are intended to be applied, so usual care. Whereas a highly explanatory trial would be not at all representative of usual care. It might take place in a highly specialized research laboratory or a research clinical center. Finally, when we're talking about organizational infrastructure, how are the resources, staff expertise, and care delivery different than what's available in usual care? A highly pragmatic approach would mean no extra non-reimbursable staff time or resources are required beyond usual care. Staff require no or minimal additional expertise or training beyond the typical norms. Whereas a highly explanatory trial with a rating of one would involve an intervention that requires significant extra staff time, resources, or payment. It requires highly specialized staff and or significant extra training, and it might often be implemented by clinical researchers themselves. So this is a contrast between explanatory and pragmatic with this Precy's example. You can see that the explanatory study on the left has much less area in incorporated, whereas the pragmatic study on the right has a much greater area represented, a larger wheel. And so this is how this plays out to be able to fully assess how pragmatic is a particular study. So let me give you an example to which we can apply the Precy's 2 tool. Dr. Gustafson led a pragmatic study at a skilled nursing facility using a pre-post design because of the tremendous variability in practice across SNFs. We evaluated 103 patients, half received usual care, and half received a high intensity resistance training intervention. We focused on patients able to weight bear without contraindications to high intensity resistance exercise. We provided the intervention via skilled nursing facility clinicians who were already practicing in that environment. And we, they included a variety of different types of exercises that were based on the functional needs of the patients. But the dose of the exercise had to be at high intensity to promote physiologic overload. As far as our implementation strategy, we used six hours of didactic portion with CE credits, so continuing education credits, one-on-one -on -one mentorship, large group problem solving sessions, and weekly meetings to discuss caseloads and barriers. The results were remarkably promising. We saw a clinically meaningful improvement in our short physical performance battery. We also saw a clinically meaningful improvement in gait speed and statistically significant improvement in gait speed, as well as increases of 20% in community discharge rates and a 3.5 day decrease in the skilled nursing facility length of stay. All outcomes in terms of the performance outcomes were assessed by the skilled nursing facility clinicians at evaluation and discharge. What was most striking about these findings was that the increase in function occurred despite a 14% decrease in the length of stay, that 3.5 decrease in, in length of stay. If patients receiving the intervention had stayed an additional 3.5 days, we wonder how much greater the functional gains might have been. So let's see how this stacks up in terms of the Precy's wheel. With respect to eligibility, 83% of all patients admitted to the skilled nursing facility were included. So we had a pretty high mark in terms of pragmatic approach for that particular um, category. When it comes to recruitment, we actually didn't have to consent patients because 
the new treatment approach became the new standard of care at the facility. So when patients agreed to come to that particular facility, they were essentially agreeing to this new treatment approach. With respect to setting, we used a real world skilled nursing facility with non-research trained clinicians. So we were very pragmatic in that category as well. But when it came to organization, which I'll remind you represents what resources were necessary to deliver the intervention, we fell a bit shorter because we, didn't spend time, we did have to spend quite a bit of time training the team and overseeing clinical care. So there was a little bit of extra effort involved in order to ensure that the clinicians were implementing the program as intended. Just to circle back to our previous graphic, this example that I just provided was a pragmatic study demonstrating initial effectiveness. And the next step is to move into an implementation study to confirm effectiveness and gain a preliminary understanding of best implementation strategies using a cluster randomized approach, randomizing at the level of the clinic. Dr. Becker will go into much more detail with respect to some of those next steps and the implementation studies and frameworks associated with them. So now I'm gonna talk about the barriers to pragmatic trials. One of the barriers is the disconnect between academic research and clinical practice. Journal articles are the driver for academic promotions, while things like building communication relationships with clinicians that take time are not incentivized. Furthermore, while journal articles are the driver for academic promotions, they're not always the primary source of information for clinical audiences. In fact, they're often lowest on the list of how clinicians learn about clinical findings. An additional example of the disconnect between academic research and clinical practice is illustrated here. An essential component of ultimately impacting clinical practice faster is framing a problem around what the stakeholders value from the beginning. How many times does an academic scientist approach a clinical group with a great idea they wanna test, only to find out that their solution doesn't begin to address the real problems at hand? Without thinking about what is of value to the stakeholders from the beginning, we end up pointing our, our hoses in the wrong direction, and we fail to put out the fires that are most pressing, which slows down eventual translation. Another barrier to pragmatic research is that real-world pragmatic research requires quite a few additional skills. I describe myself as a recovering clinical trialist, and while I still conduct clinical trials that are efficacy trials, because there's a need for those types of trials to answer specific questions, I've come to realize that with pragmatic trials, there are many more skill sets required than just traditional clinical trials. These include more than just deciding on intervention characteristics, fidelity, and outcomes that are necessary for RCTs, but also the environment in which the research is being performed. One has to understand the organization and patient characteristics, the leadership culture, the interaction between programs and the context in which they are implemented, and you have to understand the implementation and sustainability infrastructure to really make a difference. And so I'm gonna wrap up there and close with too often we have assumed, if you build it and if you have evidence, surely people will adopt the best practice. But I've come to realize that's not always the case. We have an opportunity to positively shape the future of rehabilitation research by more intentionally thinking about pragmatic approaches from the beginning. Thank you for your time. I wanna thank the individuals involved in the study I described, as well as those that helped with this presentation and my entire Restore Research team. Dr. Becker will continue and build upon the foundation that I have laid with more explanation of implementation science and frameworks. Thank you.